continue the series of messages on, on the prodigal. And I started on this, and I was hoping to get to the older brother. But the more I try to summarize, I wanted to get to this point that is so essential. And that is the sonship. There's a lot of Christians walking around who don't fully understand what it means to be a child of God. I mean, that is, you know, to them, they just cannot almost relate to it. I mean, they may believe it, you know, intellectually, but down here, they don't fully understand what it means to be a, a son, a daughter of the living God. And it's, it's so important because, you know, when Jesus told this story, you know, we told this story, and Kathy's going to be coming up to read the scriptures. I haven't forgotten, Kathy. <laughs> okay. When he told the story, he was speaking to two different groups. He was speaking to the Pharisees and scribes, the religious leaders. Okay. And then, then he was speaking also at the same time to the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, the, the low life. And he wanted to get a message across to them, to the Pharisees and the scribes and to the tax collectors and the sinners. And I believe one of the messages he wanted to get across to them was the sonship. And when you study the scriptures, you know, <laughs> you, will, you will see in the scriptures how important this is. It was so important for Jesus because the disciples asked him, you know, show us the Father. And Jesus said, as you see me, you, you see the Father. And then, it, this is the sonship here, so important that he taught his disciples how to pray, and it starts with what? Our Father. Our Father. You know. And Christ never did anything without consulting the Father. So before we go continue that and give you a quick summary, Kathy will come and read. Three portions of the scriptures from Luke, from Romans, and from Ephesians. And if someone can bring me a glass of water, that'd be great. In Luke, but the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has filled the ca fatted, fattened calf because he is back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go on, or go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeying your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Well, we had to celebrate and be glad because his br this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. Second scripture is eight, Romans 8, 7 and 8. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. And the third scripture is Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our own sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. 
You're a good man. I don't care what your wife says about you. <laughs> so we're in this fifth message now. <clears throat> the young man who made an unthinkable, shameful request from the father asking for his inheritance. In other words, he was wishing that his father was dead. And he totally dishonored his father here. The son <clears throat> was either oblivious to his own shame or totally unconcerned about it. In other words, he had this attitude. His attitude was like this. So what if this behavior brought dishonor to the whole family? I don't care. I want to do my thing and do it the way I want to do it. Now, can you imagine what the father went through? I mean, there was nothing he could do to cover or remove the shame unless he publicly disowned the kid. This young man took his portion, his one-third one of the family wealth, and he left. Didn't look back at all. He had exactly what he wanted, and that was absolute freedom. Absolute freedom. And hey, listen here. That's the bottom line here. Listen to me very carefully. When we don't surrender to God and to his ways, all we want is our freedom to do what we want to do and do it the way we want to do it. That's all we want. This young man left home. He left his heritage behind. He left his faith behind. And you know, that's still taking place today. It is. When many of our youth, not all of them, but some of them, when they head out to university or college, away from the perimeters of the family home, they leave their ethics behind and their faith behind, and they join in with the world. Some of them just dive in. I mean, mom and dad are not there to correct them. Mom and dad are not there to, to guide them. They can do whatever they want. Mom and dad doesn't know it. Sometimes <laughs> they don't have to wait to university or college. They do it right at home at, at high school. Again, I, I took a lot of coaching at school, and, and I see it. I mean, grade nine, they come in. They come in, and it's only a matter of time. I was talking to one young lady yesterday. I said, I, I, I said, I said Mackenzie, do me a favor. Talk to me about the kids that came with you into ninth grade, how many are still there and how many are now smoking grass? She said, quite a few of them. How many have left? Quite a few of them. Listen, and this is for all of us. Anytime we turn to the world to fill the emptiness in our soul, and that may be good or bad, we become the prodigal. Do we understand that? We become the prodigal. The young man begins to live out his shameful rebellion. But wait a minute here. Dr. MacArthur tells us, sin, and I quote, sin never delivers what it promises. Amen? And the pleasurable life sinners think they are pursuing always turns out to be precisely the opposite. A hard road that eventually leads to ruin and the ultimate, a little dead end. Ultimately. And I was talking to that to my men's group Wednesday night. I was telling them, okay, that Satan will always paint a picture that looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. But he will never show you the other side. Never. You see? And then I gave them an example. I said, you know, when I made a covenant with, with Satan, he gave me everything I wanted. But he didn't show me the other side. And when I found myself in Rikers Island, I heard the words clearly, Satan saying, I got you, you're mine. So the young man reaped what he sowed. And without being too harsh, the prodigal got exactly what he deserved. But listen carefully. Hallelujah. When the hound of heaven, can someone say amen? amen. When the hound of heaven, someone say amen. amen. When the hound of heaven, hallelujah, our mighty God is after you, he will get your attention sooner or later. Amen. 
You're awake this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> he will get your attention. Our mighty God is after you. He will get your attention sooner or later. And he did for this young fellow, right? So what happens? Not his decision, but what happened to him? A famine hits the land. And to him, it was about the worst thing that could possibly happen, at least from a human point of view. But from God, he's getting his attention here. He's getting his attention. And listen to me. If you're sitting here and you're running from God, and you don't want anything to do with God, listen to me very carefully. He will get your attention. He will. And when he gets your attention, you better repent. Because what follows is not going to be any better. This famine took place. It was very real. And the road that the prodigal son had chosen to follow turned out to be an expressway to destruction or a highway to hell on earth. And by the way, the prodigal son, listen to me carefully, the prodigal son here is a living symbol of every sinner who has ever lived, including you and me. Not too many amens there. <laughs> and listen, it's true. The evil motives that drove the prodigal are the natural tendencies of every one of us. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8, 7, 8, the carnal mind is hostile to God. The carnal mind does not submit to the laws of God, nor can he do so. Then those who are controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. So if you're living life the way you want to, and you want to put God aside, that's the sinful nature hostile against God. And he says, that's what you want. Go ahead and do it. Paul says, we are by nature children of wrath. Born with a sinful nature and helplessly dominated by fleshly desires. Let me put it in a more simple way. We are all prodigal sons and daughters. Every one of us is guilty, and you can say amen when you want to, is guilty of self-indulgence, selfish behavior, and uncontrollable lust, and ignore the consequences of sin. How many of us have gone through that? We know we're going to sin, and we don't care about the consequences. And then after we do it and face the consequences, I should have never done that. Right? This is real, my friends. MacArthur says, apart from God's restraining grace, Every one of us who have long ago sold our birthright, wasted our lives, and squandered every blessing God has given us. And listen, treading away his bountiful daily goodness, we sang the song, in exchange for a brief moment of cheap self-gratification. End of quote. So this guy found himself in this pit of hell. And now he's filled with remorse. And he repents of his wrongful ways. He comes to his senses. And my friends, here I am convinced where true repentance always begins. With an accurate assessment of one's own condition, a true sense of facing life the way it really should be. In other words, you take a good look at your life. You take a good look at your life. No mask. And you say to yourself, oh, my Lord, did I mess up? Amen? Amen. And you said, God, I need help. I need help here. You see, follow me, okay? He was ready to go back home. Well, how? He was well far from a, a mere mind and change on an intellectual exercise. In other words, this is more than saying, I want to change. It's more than that. Because how many times we have said that? I want to change. And do we change? Talk to me now. No. <laughs> For a while, right? 
But listen, genuine repentance always demonstrates itself in the brokenness of the sinner's self-will. The will has to be surrendered. It's quiet now. It's very quiet because uh, I believe that we have quite a few people here who do not want that will to be surrendered. He was a broken man. Totally broken. And my friends, repentant faith is the only means by which a sinner can find justification before God. We don't earn our salvation by works. Amen? Amen. Though good works, <laughs> according to James, right? It's obvious, the obvious fruit of the, of the spirit, of faith. But people who repent and turn to God are fully and instantly justified, freely forgiven from the first moment of faith inception and before a single good work is done. But for the religious people, for the scribes and Pharisees, <laughs> They're listening to the story and they're saying, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. This kid has to work his way back. He's not that free now. He needs to earn his way back into the Father's good grace. He has to work really hard, long and hard and long to, to earn God's favor and forgiveness. Not at all. Not at all. His entire future, I love this, his entire future was now completely dependent on the mercy of the Father. The Father. And according to Deuteronomy 21.21, this boy was supposed to be stoned, and I'm not thinking about weed, right? Stoned because what he did, the moment he did what he did, everybody in that village had the right to pick up a stone and kill him. But they didn't. Because the father was truly eager to initiate forgiveness and reconciliation with his son. And that's why the father ran to the boy. So he can be the first person to reach him. So that he could deflect the abuse he knew the boy would suffer. He knew that. And what the father did was unbelievable. And was a shameful, MacArthur says, a shameful response. He kept bringing shame to himself. He was so oblivious to his own reputation. The father just, I mean, was giving the son honor after honor after honor. Can you imagine the religious leaders? I mean, they are so confused. They're so uptight. Oh, man. In a culture where honor was so essential, above all else, the father was concerned only with the return of his son back home. And he gave the boy the three gifts, right? First one is what? The gift of honor, the robe. That's right. This was an expensive, one-of-a-kind outer garment of the highest quality fabric and craftsmanship. The father was publicly honoring his returning son not only as a guest of honor at the banquet, but also as a person of the utmost distinction. He gave him the second thing. The, the ring. The gift of authority. Ownership. Able to sign any legal document. I don't know if I put the word there. Did I put the word there? Um, I'm hesitating how to say it because it's one of those Puerto Rican things trying to say a Latin word. Uh, usufruct, S, help me here, at U-S-U-F-R-U-C-T. It's up. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay. And you know what that means? That's similar to the power of attorney. In other words, he has now, everything still belongs to the father, but he has, okay, an example, a piece of land. The land belongs to the father. If he wants to, he could, you know, get some uh, beef cattle, you know, and, and uh, get beef going. and make, He's able to get a profit, get the profit from that. The land and the beef belongs to the father, but the profit goes to the son. You understand what I'm trying to say here? 
He's giving him the authority, the ownership. I mean, everything, everything. Say, everything belongs to you. The sandals, the robe, the ring, all belong to the Father and were symbols of his honor and authority. This is so important in sonship. The Father was, in effect, telling the kid, my paraphrase, okay? Son, listen here for a moment. The best that I have is yours. Son, do you understand that? You don't have to work at all. Just drop the burden you are carrying. You are now fully restored to sonship. And by the way, you are elevated in a household to a position of honor. Oh my, this is incredible. Do you fully understand that? Because now, son, we're going to celebrate. No longer are you a rebellious son. If we fully understand what I'm saying here, it makes a difference how we treat our children. It makes a difference how we treat our spouses. It makes a difference how we treat other people. If we understand this. No longer are you a rebellious son. Now you are a full-grown adult son with all the privileges that comes with that position, and I want you to enjoy it fully. Great and wonderful gifts you sang, didn't you? This is sonship. But did you notice that the father did this publicly? Why? To eliminate any question from anyone's mind about whether he really meant it or not. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, angel. Don't we know someone who did the same thing? Someone did it for us. Yes, we do. Because the Father here is a symbol of Christ. Paul says, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And what are these verses are saying here? Christ is always existed with God. Number two, Christ is equal to God because he is God. And though Christ is God, he became man, fully man, 100% man, in order to fulfill God's plan of salvation for all people. Christ did not just have the appearance of being a man, and that was a major teaching in the early church. A group of people, the Gnostics, were teaching that, okay? He actually became human to identify with our sins. Christ voluntarily laid aside his divine rights and privileges out of love for his father. Christ died on the cross for our sins so we don't have to face eternal death. God glorified Christ because of his obedience. God raised Christ to his original position at the right hand of God where he reigns forever as our Lord and judge. That is what those verses are saying. Timothy Keller tells us, if the behavior of the father in this parable seems exaggerated, don't miss the fact that the disgrace the father bore could not possibly be exaggerated enough to even begin to be in the same league and the humility of Christ. End of quote. In other words, when you read this story and fully understand what's happening here, what the father is doing for the son, when you fully grasp that, That's only minor league compared to what Jesus did for us. You getting this point? How essential it is? Follow me now. The the parable reminds us that Christ received sinners from the low life, the scum of the earth, to basically good people. He receives them with the same kind of gladness seen in this parable and infinitely more. And in the words of Paul, justifies the ungodly 
Christ justifies the ungodly. So when we come to Christ, God, this is important, God looks at us like we have never sinned. And everything we did wrong is now gone. Totally forgiven by the grace of God. And this is so important because sometimes we are filled singing the song, my name is regret. Sometimes we live a life regretting the things that we have done. God forgives us, but sometimes we hold on to that. But more important than that, sometimes we hold regret against people who hurt us or sin against us. And listen here. That was the very issue that put the scribes and Pharisees at odds with Christ. They refused to see Jesus' ministry of seeking and saving sinners as an activity of God. They refused that. They couldn't believe that the Messiah that they're waiting for would do such a thing and promote that he would justify sinners through faith alone. And instantly treat them as they have a perfect standing with God. I've been to churches where they met with me and they said they, they, they want to grow. I said, do you really want to grow? Yeah. Are you willing to do anything so you could grow as a church? Yeah. Okay, so we go over some principles of evangelism. I said, you know what? What are you going to do when drug addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes and the low life that society considers the low life and the worst of sinners begin to come and sit down? What are you going to do? I'll tell you exactly what you're going to do. You're going to begin to tell your young people, don't hang around with those young people. You're going to begin to say, yeah, they, they could come. They could become members, but they cannot be leaders. You get the point? They want growth with their own expectations. And what happens? Sometimes they come down the aisle and people almost resent that they're there. The church grows. Those that like to be maintained don't like it, creates a problem, and before you know it, everyone that has come in because of that walks out the door and they're gone. That's what I asked you not too long ago. What would you do if a prostitute comes down the aisle and is dressed like one, how would you react? How would you look at that person? You see, the Pharisees and the scribes, I mean, they're a bunch of characters. We need to remind ourselves once again that this is a picture of God's lavish grace which triumphs over imaginable, any imaginable kind of sin, God saves sinners, including the very worst of sinners. That includes people who murder other people. Does that mean that they don't face the consequences? Oh, no. God forgives. Amen? But you still got to face the consequences. And if God is able, by his grace, forgive them, who are we to hold that against them? It's getting quiet here. My friends, when people get saved, God instantly elevates the new Christian to a position of privilege and blessing that is exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything we could ever ask or think. 
I mean, why would they reject this? Well, after all, most of them have labored their whole life at their religion. All of them. And Christ treated them with less respect than he showed to the tax collectors. They didn't like that at all. Christ, I mean, he went to the sinner and says, I love you. When he went to the Pharisees, I love you. Ooh, stay back. And everything the father was doing for the son was exactly the opposite of what anyone thought he should do. And according to MacArthur, it was contrary to the society's customs and it went against everything they knew about justice. Don't get too excited here. I'm almost finished. Now think about it. The anger and the resentment has increased a hundredfold. And now they hear the father say these words. Bring the fatted calf. Bring it here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And this tells me, first of all, that this guy was extremely wealthy. And this calf would have provided the choicest grain-fed veal. The most tender, tasty, prime meat. Stop it, Pastor. That's an expensive luxury even today. It was extremely rare to even think of feeding precious grain to an animal. Are you beginning to get the picture of what's going on? This is a preparation. It will take the rest of the day, and the party will be long. I mean, it will be a long party. Sometimes it's three days, and about 150, 200 people will come. That's the whole village. This was unbelievable. It was the, the greatest event. This party was going to be all day long. And tremendous celebration. It was probably the greatest affair that village has ever seen. It was a time of celebration. Remember the parable of the lost sheep that Christ said before this parable? The lost sheep, he lost the sheep, and what happened? And he, and what did he do? Okay. He called his friends, and they, he says, come join me, rejoice with me. What I have lost, I have found. And the lost coin, right? When she found it, she called her friends, you know, get on, got, got on her, you know, iPhone, yo, yo. Come, I found it. Let's rejoice. And that's what's happening here. From the father's viewpoint, that was fitting. No event could bring more joy to him than the return of his lost son. This son was considered dead, but is now alive and has life. Now, who gave him his life? You know, it's okay to raise your voice. <laughs> who gave him his life? The father. The father. It was the father who gave this boy back his life and privileges. It was the father who gave him, restored him to sonship, gave him true liberty, and showered him with tokens of love. Sonship, sonship. The feast honors the father. The father gave mercy, forgiveness, and love. And the whole village comes to rejoice with this shameless father who celebrates his own grace, celebrates his mercy. The son has new life, a new status. He has for the first time a real loving relationship with his father. That is so important. This, my friends, as I'm ending here, is a vivid picture of heaven's joy whenever one lost sinner repents. Look at verse 24. They began to be merry. Listen, this was, this was only the start. And this is a picture of a party that never ends. And that's what heaven's joy is all about. 
It is the endless celebration of the extravagant grace of a loving father to penitent, hallelujah, believing, altogether unworthy sinners. God will never turn them away. God replaces the stinky, ragged clothing of the sinner with his own rope of righteousness. God gives us love, his love, his honor, his responsibility, and full right to represent him. God rejoices and has a gigantic party. Listen to me. Not only when 10,000 people get saved at a major crusade. Okay? <laughs> ah, but you who work with children, you're going to love this one. Hallelujah. But God also rejoices when a little child and Sunday school, and junior church, or kneeling at his bed as Jesus into their hearts. There's a party in heaven. There's a party in heaven. Heaven's joy doesn't end when the sinner comes home. That's only the beginning. I mean, how many billions of people we have? I don't know, five, six billion? With all those people, I'm sure there's people getting saved every day. Right? So is that party ending in heaven? It's going on. And you think that heaven was going to be boring. Oh, no. God's own joy is overflowing every time one sinner returns. And the party goes on and keeps going and going and going. Then one day the question will be asked in heaven. Who is worthy? And we all say, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gloria a Dios. Be praised and honor and glory and power forever and ever and ever. Can we say amen? Amen. Can we say hallelujah? hallelujah? We're going to sing that song. But next time we meet, you see, the Pharisees and the scribes, they're all upset. They're angry. They're resentful. And now Christ begins to talk about their boy. You ever see uh, Rocky one when Apollo Creed was coming down? Everybody was cheering and jumping up, you know? I guess, unless you're a boomer. <laughs> All right, remember that scene, okay? They're all excited, and he's jumping. That's what the Sadducees and that the scribes and Pharisees are doing. They're jumping up and down. They're doing the wave. Here comes our man. This is our man. He's going to teach Jesus a thing or two. But for that, you got to wait till I come back. As we close with prayer, if there's someone here this morning... And God spoke to you about becoming a child of God. And you're too little to reserve to come to the front and pray. Please give me a call. I'll be more than glad to sit down with you and explain more on salvation and what it means to a son, be a son or a daughter of the living God. I want to help you get saved so that party in heaven can continue down and on. Amen? Amen? Father, I thank you. For this wonderful story, oh God, it teaches us so many things, so many truths, oh Lord. And it challenges each one of us. And Lord, I pray that you take these words right now. You are the one that brings conviction, not me. You're the one. As people go home, Lord, that you will speak to those that need to hear the message of salvation or those that need to make a rededication to Christ. They follow you at one time, but they turn to the world and realize the world is not the answer. I pray for them. And I pray, oh God, if there's anyone here, by any chance, working really hard to please you, trying to climb the ladder to you, Lord, that they may understand that it's all about relationship. Relationship. They don't have to work so hard. All they need to do is turn to Jesus. Turn their eyes to Jesus. He's everything to us. Now, Lord, I pray 
a blessing upon everyone here this morning. May the God who loves you, and may the God who empowers you, and may the God who pour his grace upon you, extravagant grace, be with you not only at this moment, but be with you this day, this week, this month, and this year. And may this be a year of fruitfulness for you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.